Join me in prayer. God, as we share in this message this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, that you would renew us, inspire us, send us back into the world, new people. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this week I'm wrapping up an opportunity for us to look at stories of old, those stories that we may have learned in our children's ministry days where they were told and you walked away, and yet so often as adults, we don't, or as a church, we don't come back to them and take a deep dive into what they may be teaching us about ourselves, about who God is. And so today we're going to look at that great story of David and Goliath, a story that's powerful, a story of, of the underdog, and it's been told it's an archetypal story. It's a story that was told then, but speaks to us now and informs us and shapes us in our own lives. David and Goliath is a great story powerful story, but before we jump right into the story that you heard EDK read, I want to go back for a minute because you have to know the backstory of who David is. David was one of the most prolific kings in Israel's history. David was far from perfect. We are not going to focus on those particular stories today. You could do a whole, gosh, you could do like a year sermon series on David, couldn't you? You could just go on and on and on. But we're going to focus, we're not going to focus on them. But what's important for us to remember today that despite his imperfections, he was known for his mighty acts. David's story in our Hebrew Bible can be found primarily in first and second Samuel, if you want to go and read all of that before Tuesday, I'm looking at you, Gordon and Cam, wherever you all are before Tuesday, just read all of First and Second Samuel. That's, you have time, don't you? Yeah, that's fine. I, I, I assume you will. <laughs> but uh, David was a writer and a musician, and so many of the Psalms came from his musicianship. David's lineage led for generations all the way through Jesus. So we often hear uh, about David all the way into the New Testament. And what I love about the story of David, David is that he was able to change the world by using the ordinary gifts that God gave him. I want to speak for a moment just about the time that David claimed and rose to power he rose to power during a time when Israel was was a loosely connected group of people they were ruled by prophets and by judges and things were good things were okay and yet if you go back and you look at the story there were these growing threats of rising nations around them one of which were the Philistines. And so they wanted to become unified under one king to be prepared for the threats. So they make an appeal to the prophet Samuel to pick a king. And Samuel, the prophet Samuel, is faithful and obedient. And he begins to listen to God. And he ultimately anoints Saul as king. And things were good under Saul until they weren't. As he rose to power, Saul stopped listening, the story tells us, stopped listening to to God and began listening to the voices of the people around him. Things got so bad for Saul that God finally rejects Saul as king. And at this point in the story, God goes back to Samuel and asks him to begin to listen again for the next king. And he tells him at that point to go to Jesse, who has all these sons, go to Jesse in Bethlehem, because among him is the next king. So we see in the story, Samuel makes his way to Jesse. He says to Jesse, bring before me all of your sons, one of which will be anointed king. And so can you imagine as a parent, it's like, well, I better clean the, these boys up pretty fast here. Cleans them all up, lines them, as you can imagine, from biggest to smallest and presents them to Samuel. I always imagine sort of the tension in the room at the time as Samuel goes one 
The first son thinking, well, obviously it's me. No, God is silent. So the next one, well, if he's not going to be, it's got to be me. And he makes his way down the list. He moves son to son, and God is silent. Not one is chosen. And Samuel, in that moment, finds himself entirely confused. I mean, if we were talking the NFL draft, this is the first, what's it called? The first, first day, first pick, whatever, you know, sports ball, those things. But the first round, that's what it is. This is the first round. I had to look at my notes here. You'd think I would know with my children, but I don't. <laughs> and, and none of them, none of them are chosen. So at this time, Samuel looks to Jesse and says, do you have any more? (laughs) Jesse says, I mean, he's got to be laughing. There's no way. And Samuel says, there's no way. What do you mean there's no way? He says, I mean, I have this one. He's out there somewhere. He's one of those musician types, you know. You, You don't want him. Samuel says, I am not going to sit down until you bring him to me. So off Samuel goes, and, or off Jesse goes, and they bring this ragtag little last of the brothers. The youngest, the smallest, the most unlikely, the one they knew no one would ever choose to go into battle to lead No one saw it coming. But you know who did see it coming? God did. Because see, here's the thing. God doesn't see the way we see. In the story, it says God sees the heart See, this is the first moment for us to pause in the story today and say, this is a lesson for you and for me. God sees possibilities in us even when others do not. And see, God wants us to see the world in the very same way through the lens of which God sees. I want you to to, to think. Do you believe that? Do you practice seeing the way God sees? Do I? What do you see when you see the world around you? Do you see possibilities? Or more importantly, I want to start with myself. What do I see? What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see yourself the way God sees you? See, God doesn't want us to just remember this. God wants us to believe it, to live it, and then to see the rest of the world in the same way. And see, this story... The story was God helping Israel remember. Remember, a a while ago I, I said to you, the definition of remember is to not forget. And they had forgotten their story. See, they were this measly group of people in captivity, and and when they were delivered from the biggest superpower of the day, Egypt, when they were delivered. They had forgotten that that God had chosen the most unlikely person. He tried to argue with God so long, I think God even got tired. And yet God convinced Moses to do this extraordinary work from this ordinary man. God sees possibility even when everyone else does not. And this was Israel's story, and they had forgotten. And so often, this is our story, 
too. When we see the way the world sees, there are so many limitations. It's the can'ts. And yet when we see the way God sees, we are invited to change the world like Moses, like David, like Jesus when he, when he walked the earth. And so God anoints David king. And at first, Saul is filled, the story says, is filled with rage and jealousy and anger, so much so that he wants to kill David. But it's this beautiful interaction in the story where David used this very unlikely tool to change Saul's heart. He doesn't use power. He doesn't use weapon. He doesn't use violence. He uses music. <laughs> I love this. He plays this song of hope. And the story tells us that Saul is changed and he loved David from then on very much. The story goes on to say that they find themselves in this encampment right across the valley. There is this other encampment. It's the encampment of the Philistines. And they're about to have this huge showdown when the Philistines send out to the valley this one person. And it's this man named Goliath. And the story says that he is this large man who is strong and no one is going to beat him in this fight. And so day in and day out, the story of 1 Samuel says, when the Israelites saw the outward appearance of this giant man, they were terrified. And every day for 40 days, Goliath would walk out and he would shout into the, to the Israelites, who's going to come and fight me? And no one showed up. Well, right about that time in the story, David is sent to bring some, um, some food, some nourishment to those who are in the encampment. And as David is arriving and as he is preparing to bring this nourishment, he hears this Goliath shout, who's going to come out and fight me? David says, well, who's going to go? You can imagine, not me. They all look at each other. And he begins to ask these questions of those in the encampment. And then he finally says, well, I'll go. Are you crazy? Have you looked in the mirror, David? There is no way. You're not even a warrior. You're a musician. And so a battle ensues, and that's what we know of the story, the story of David and Goliath, where we know that the underdog beats the warrior. How? See, David was seeing things the way that God saw them. David knew in the midst of slaying that giant, that God was with him, and he believed it. It's possible that maybe the giant couldn't see very well. It says that maybe he had blurred vision. You have to also remember that Goliath made his way into that valley with so much armor on. He also had a spear, a javelin, and a sword. And you just have to imagine him sitting there weighed down with so much of the earthly things that David didn't have. David also knew that they had been there for 40 days and 40 nights and possibly fatigue was setting in. And so David saw things differently. He wasn't seeing the giant like everybody else. David saw his heart. And David saw possibility. Everyone else was afraid and quiet, but somehow, with God with him, he knew who and whose he was. See, he knew he was capable of so much 
because he saw the way God saw. And so often we choose to see ourselves the way the world does. And so we limit what we think we are capable of. So I want to ask you, what do you think you're capable of? Do you see your possibilities to slay giants in our world? To instill hope in the world around you, even when paralyzed in fear? There was a great story that came out of Ukraine. It was a story of a 15-year-old boy named Andre. He was one of very few who knows how to fly drones with experience and specialized expert expertise. And so at 15 years old, the community of leaders came to him. And they asked him, a 15-year-old, if he would help them and figuring out what was happening among the Russians in the area. So this 15-year-old flies these drones and is able to provide information to the Ukraines in a way that he was able to give hope to his entire community and to help keep them safe. If you saw a picture of him, you'd say, what? Him? There's no way he could be of any help. And yet Andre saw the possibility too. He believed in the gifts he had been given, and he used them to change the world. God sees possibility in us even when others cannot. And God longs for us to see the same things. What can you do? What are you capable of? Do you know that each one of us has the capacity to change the world in our own ordinary mundane ways? Even in ordinary life, God longs for us to see possibility even when it feels like we're insignificant or undersized. And God sees our heart. God sees that we are capable of doing extraordinary things. But see, we have to be willing to see it too. This is David's story the ordinary doing extraordinary things. So what will you do? What are you capable of? Amen.